Six cooks, <laughs> six countries, six incredible journeys. <laughs> Stepping outside their comfort zones. It's not for the faint-hearted, for sure. Our cooks will travel far and wide. Route 7 all the way. To find some of the most exciting food on the planet. If you're back in the UK, you've got a tandoori chicken. Nothing like this. It's beautiful. This is the best food I've had in Egypt. It's pure, it's got heritage. It's got love in it, you know. They'll go off the beaten track. Crocodile. Crocodile sausages. Meeting extraordinary people. Exploring ways of life unchanged for centuries. No electric blenders in the jungle. Have to do everything by hand. Take your life into your own hands. You're on the road now. As they travel, they'll see how the language of food transcends cultural differences. I've never hoofed on a cheese before. <laughs> and a world away from home. This is why I love Australia. There's no excuse for a bad fire in Australia. This is the beginning. Where do we end? They'll learn lessons that could change the way we cook forever. I've been cooking a barbecue wrongly all my life. Wow. This time, it's Rick Stein, down under. I'm in love with abalone. There's still prawns on the barbie. Bit of perno, olive oil, garlic. But Australian tastes are shifting. I sense there's a seismic change happening. Rick is going south. You know where you have to go. Where? To Tasmania. It's the wild foodie frontier. That's gorgeous. Wow. An island of new ideas. This is in a class of its own. And old-fashioned hospitality. You choose to steal my produce, I hope you choke. <laughs> In 1966, I was 19 years old and in a bad place. I wanted to be in a good one, somewhere sunny, optimistic, somewhere nobody could have the blues. And this was it, Australia. I love this beach. And I first came to Australia when my father died, tragically he committed suicide. And I was completely sort of pent up and not sure what I wanted to do. And I just thought, I know, I'll run away to Australia. And when I came here, I, I was just, the, one of the things, I suppose people associate me with the Atlantic and the fish and all that. But when I came here, I was just amazed about the variety of fish, the quantity of fish, how you could go fishing anywhere and just catch fish, big ones, colorful ones, the sort of fish I'd never seen before. And I think it was that and cooking fish that, that almost kick-started me off to, to opening a restaurant back in Britain. 50 years on, I have a home in a small town called Mollymook, south of Sydney. Mollymook is a sleepy, salty place, home to people who love to be near the water and a resort for families who want a bucket and spade holiday. It's a bit like Padstow, without the advantages of rain and gales and fog, but with the splendid advantage of having a fish restaurant in it, owned by me. Morning. This is my Australian home from home. The number one topic of conversation is fish. What's fresh? and what's trending out in the dining room. Knowing what people are asking for is how you monitor changing tastes. Over the years, I've seen Aussie food fashions come and go. Old French, slow food, fast food, Pacific Rim, Asian fusion, and of course, Nouvelle Cuisine. I've been coming here for 50 years. Wow. But in that time, it's just been amazing how it's changed, because when I first came here, the food was really what I describe as pies and pints. 
or probably more correctly, pies and schooners. It was really simple, sort of British-based food. But everything's changing, it keeps changing, and you just got to keep up with it. I mean, as a restaurateur, you have to, otherwise people don't come to your restaurant. So I've got to know what's happening. And I sense there's another seismic change happening again. My house, sundown, a little party, because I've just had another birthday. My guests are foodie friends and neighbours. Everybody needs good neighbours. They've always looked to the rest of the world for culinary inspiration. But I think the feeding habits of Homo Australis are changing. Going local, that's my instinct. I think I've got everything right. I think I know what Aussies like at a, a good barbecue, but you never be too sure because things are moving on all the time. And that's, as I was saying, part of why I want to do this barbecue, just to ask a few people I, who I know, know a lot about food in Australia, where we're going next. The humble Australian barbie is a good example of how things change. Blokes used to stand about talking sport and incinerating sausages. Now they want to know what's in your marinade. Um, it's just a little bit of fennel, a bit of perno, olive oil, garlic. Here's another change. Almost all this food came from within 100 miles. Even 10 years ago, lots of it would have been imported. Can we just start eating because it's getting cold? I gave it a few minutes for the food and the wine to take effect, and then I began to talk to Helen Patience. She grew up on tin spaghetti. These days, she's all sun-dried tomato. We're so lucky here. I know. And I, I think our appetite is becoming more sophisticated. We used to be more like steak and sausages and all that basic food, but now the Australian food's fantastic. We spent the last 15 years searching for an Australian cuisine, and there isn't one, no. and we're happy with that now. All there is now is the best <laughs> produce where we can add all those flavours from yeah. around the world yeah. and make it work. Oh, you are so right, Simon. We can grow everything from Mediterranean to cold climate to tropical. We've got everything. Why would you want to cook anywhere else? To look at Australia as a whole, I think just the climate makes all the difference, doesn't it? You've got to get down to Tasmania. Apparently, that's where it's at. I've heard this before. The island of Tasmania is the new go-to place for wonderful produce. You know oh, where you have to go? Where? Tassie. Everybody keeps telling me that. Oh, but wh why? What's so special about, about it? Though? There's no pollution. So you've got a pristine environment. Some of the best-tasting apricots are coming out of Tassie right now. Fishing, beautiful listening to those people they're, they're really into local produce I was so interested in what I had to say about Tasmania because I think they see Tasmania as being this sort of almost mystical island of the best produce anywhere in Australia and if I should become a stranger you know that it would make me more than sad so I'm going to have to go to Tasmania I've only been there once before which is possibly once more than most Australians. It's always been a backwater, until now. But my culinary journey has to start in Sydney, where all foodie fads and fashions kick off. If there are seismic changes due, Sydney's where I'll feel the earth move. From Mollymook, it takes about three and a half hours to get to Sydney, a drive of 200 miles. It's also a 50-year step back in my own story, the place where I first got off the boat in 1966. In the 60s, I was incredibly influenced by uh, rock and roll, and rather more American rock and roll than British. Obviously, the, the Beatles and the Stones I was really keen on. But in the mid-60s, I started to get into surfing music, and particularly the Beach Boys. And about that time too, the local council in Cornwall started employing Australian lifeguards. And I was very taken with those, those Australians. They were so lean and tanned, 
and they spoke of the Beach Boys and they spoke of beautiful Australian suntan girls. So I didn't head for California, I headed for Australia. Back then, Australia seemed to be a place where anything was possible. And that was partly because of the attitude of the people. They were extremely friendly. An hour into my journey, a chance to see if what Australians call mateship is still as strong today. In the 80s, this all-in-it-together attitude led to the creation of the Driver Reviver, saving lives with free tea and biscuits. It's also a bastion of unreconstructed, but possibly reconstituted Aussie Tucker. The great contribution to world cuisine, the Australian meat pie. Hello. Hello. What can I get you? Well, I quite like a, a cup of tea. Cup of tea. Yeah. yeah, cup of tea. And, and yeah. you haven't got any pies, have yeah. you? Yeah, pie. Meat pie. Yeah, 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 love one. I'm very impressed with this. Do, do you do this every day in the? No, no, no. Only during the summer we do oh, it at yeah, weekends. Yeah, at weekends. Long weekends. This is a, this is a uh, a government sponsored idea to get people to rest. I sometimes, you know, I'm getting on a bit. I sometimes get a bit sleepy, you know, when I'm driving. Oh. It's I a safety it, thing, really. It's just, it's yeah. to see. You should yeah. stop every couple of hours. Yeah. Got some sauce. I'd thick. love to. Um... Oh, God. Brilliant. <laughs> oh, no. You can wear that now. <laughs> Real Aussie sauce. <laughs> mm. I always slightly wonder what's inside them, though. You don't think about it. You don't. <laughs> just don't uh, ask questions, don't road you? Road kill kangaroo, just all that sort of thing. <laughs> 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 I'd call this Aussie meat pie calibration, all right? Because I can remember these when I first arrived in the 60s. So this is one end. This is a way of saying this is where we start with Aussie food. And where do we end? This is the beginning. Where do we end? This is, if you like, the sort of primeval Aussie food. <laughs> <laughs> Sydney's changed a lot in my time. Today it feels comfortably middle-aged, but back in 1967 it seemed very young. Even the opera house was under 10. The ship I arrived on docked at a wharf that's now a trendy boardwalk full of restaurants. Food wasn't fashion, it was fuel, and the local food culture was an import, like me. Well, after that initial visit, I then started coming again and again. I couldn't stay away. And what I did notice, right back from the early 80s, was the growth of, first of all, Italian, Greek, but then, well, there was always Chinese, but Vietnamese, really good Thai restaurants. And the great thing was, they were all easy to get at you could walk to really good food. Today, I'm a pillar of the community. But at 19, when I first arrived here in Sydney, I was all bum fluff and backpack. I'd had a bit of catering training in London, but I wasn't here to cook. I wanted adventure. I took off for the interior of Australia, looking for work as a labourer and looking for love with suntan girls. It was when I came back here to Sydney's Kirribilli neighbourhood that I started cooking in a student flat in a grotty back street. I don't think students can afford to live around here now. This is it. This is the flat, ground floor. That was my room. There's the door. We used to have fantastic parties in there, just unbelievable. I remember once I managed to get this nurse from the Royal North Shore Hospital into bed, but I was so drunk, I fell asleep. And I woke up in the morning, one of my friends was banging on this door. And I told him what had happened, how I'd just fallen asleep. He said, you're a true Aussie now. Well, it's not, it's not much of a view, but um, it's pretty iconic, the view. See the old ship passing by. I mean, yeah, it, it, it's sure bringing back some memories for me, I must say. Very happy to be back here. 
was a really good fishmonger up in Kirribilli. And I started cooking for my flatmates. And it was sort of that. They, they said, you really can cook. I mean, I used to do, like, grilled fish and things like the pasta and bolognese sauce and all that sort of thing. But it was, it was in this flat, 97 Kirribilli Avenue, that I really began to realise I could cook and, and have people really enthused about what I was doing. Back then, despite being surrounded by bounteous seas full of gorgeous fish, most Australians just wanted meat and two veg. The Sydney fish market was a bunch of sheds full of blokes off the boats haggling with dealers. Now, it's a magnet for Sydney's foodies. And what is great about this market is it's absolutely packed with people who can see how wonderful Australian fish is. And when I first came here and saw fish like this, I was just blown away. I mean, because fish is so theatrical anyway. I love fish. Incredibly, 70% of the fish eaten in Australia is imported. But most of these fish are from native waters. They're costlier, but look at the crowds they draw. Exactly the evidence I'm looking for, for a growing interest in eating Australian. Hi. Hey, mate, how are you? Very well. Could I just have a small Travala? Blue eye, they're normally called. Oh, yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah, just one side. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, no problem. And I'd like a garfish. Yeah, yeah no problem. Maybe I'll have a small sand whiting. Yeah, a small sand whiting. It's a little bit of a fillet of a, a scorpion fish. Just one side of that. Yeah, yeah, right. that'd be lovely. Yeah, okay, no problem. Well, I will have a flounder as well. I think that that's the best for me, the best flatfish over here. I'm a bit like, a, as they say in Aussie, a kid in the lolly shop. <laughs> Understandably, a lot of people can't wait to get eating. So they'll cook your fish for you on the spot, from net to pan to plate. Well, I'm looking forward to this. I must say, I think I probably ordered a bit too much, but really, I just wanted to try it. And I got, oh my gosh, I certainly have ordered. And a bit, bit on the side too. Oh, good Lord. I think I'll probably start with the garfish. Fish is wonderful. Next, my favourite fish. And this is sand whiting. Not a bit like our own whiting. Really, really good flavour. And this is the, uh, the blue eye. That is good flavour. Now then, I often say that um, in Australia, you don't get really good flatfish, but I would make an exception for this, which is called the yellow belly flounder. This may look like gluttony, but the crew will devour what I leave like gannets. Oh. The Aussie seas are a fishmonger's delight, and the land is one big meat department. Overrun by kangaroos, infested with rabbits, and besieged by wild camels. Might a nation that's now discovering its fish be persuaded to try these challenging meats as well? Um, have you got any, like, Australian meat, like wild meat, like kangaroo or anything? It's over there. Over there? Thank you very much, though. Seems they might. Uh, here we are. So you've got kangaroo mince, kangaroo burgers, Wow, that is really amazing. Camel burgers, crocodile sausages, tail steak. Unleash your wild side, it says. <laughs> oh, my God. Heston's got his sausage in first. Look at this. But of course he's ahead of the game, with wild fruits and berries. He's got um, bush tomato in there, which are very tasty, you must say. And there, he's got pepper berry. Heston's offering his services at the supermarket. But what about other top chefs? Is there bush tucker on Sydney's poshest menus? Rockpool is the creation of one of Australia's greatest chefs, Neil Perry. When the food press started writing about food found or foraged in the wild, like me, Neil's head chef, Phil Wood, took notice. When I called him up, 
He said native plants weren't as easy as your common or garden veg. If anybody's doing cutting edge yeah. cooking, it would be you. And are you using any of these ing ingredients? Well, it's quite challenging to use them, to be yeah. honest. Um, the biggest thing is that the seasons are so short. With these little fruits and vegetables, maybe I'll get it for three weeks or two weeks, and then you'll never see it again until the next year. So by the time you've worked out what to do with it, it's gone. <laughs> and you've got to wait a whole other year, and you maybe have moved on. So, you know, it's, they're hard to use. What's this, this one? This has actually got quite a pretty name. It's Slim and Aspen. So... Oh, that is really nice. It is. It's really bright, acidic, and, and it's got this lovely sort of, you know, fresh lemon flavour. But cooked. It's just absolutely terrible. Horrible. And this yeah. one, then? Is... Um, yeah, it's a rye bree. So... Not nice. quite so good. Not quite so good, yeah. Sort of, sort of a little bit eucalyptus. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and quite acidic. And um, these, then? Well, these are my favourite, actually. The munchries. Munchries? Munchries, yeah. So they're a little berry and they kind of taste like a bruised apple. So they they called... do. They've got a definite apple flavour. Yeah, so to market them, they call them a, a native apple. This looks like a plum. And it is, yeah. It's a Davidson plum. So... Right. <laughs> yeah. What sort of plum is it? Davidson plum. These are the ones that are sort of made it out of the country. And you start to see them on menus, like trendy menus around, around the world. Um, finger limes. Finger limes. So you just open it up and then you can just squeeze out all these little caviar like Oh, they're citrus. good because not only do they taste like a lovely fragrant lime. Yeah, but they've got a beautiful oh. texture. Do you think people like you yeah. can make these things happen? Really? Well, I hope so. Yeah, it'd be nice if we could start using things that are actually grown and indigenous to Australia, you know, and, and, and give us a bit more of a voice. You know, it'd be good to base a little bit more around the stuff that we have here. Almost 90% of Australia's plants are found nowhere else. A lot of them are edible, but until Delia finishes how to boil a muntry, cooking with them is a matter of trial and error. But the knowledge I need isn't found in cookbooks. The first Australians didn't write their recipes down for 40,000 years. They didn't just survive, they thrived on wild foods. It was really interesting talking to Phil about native fruit, vegetables and herbs. But I'm on the beach now and I'm going to meet a local Aboriginal chef and I think she's going to teach me a whole lot more. This is Botany Bay, where Captain Cook first landed. It's also where today's visitors are constantly coming into land overhead. My guide is Jo Wallace. She's a chef trained in the classical French tradition who first learned to cook at the knee of her Aboriginal mum, Donna. So her food is a bit of a fusion of ancient and modern. Well, I didn't know I was going to be taken on as a sort of sous chef, but um, Jo's got me making pesto. I've got some garlic in here, a bit of olive oil. Doesn't sound that Aboriginal, but we'll see. Some macadamia nuts. Yes, they're very Aboriginal. But this is what makes it really authentic. In place of basil, warrigal greens, straight from the bush, literally. So are these, are these more of the warrigals? Yeah, these are the warrigal greens, Australia's native spinach. They're found around Botany Bay here, which is where Captain Cook landed. Well, Captain Cook had known about warrigal greens? Yes, we? he did. He fed it to the crew so they wouldn't uh, pick up scurvy along their travels. Can I taste a bit? You, you, I mean, I'm only asking you, they're not poisonous when you eat them. Like... You can eat a little bit raw. You're not allowed to eat too much of it because it does have a bit of a poisonous oh. act of it. But once we, once we blanch it, yeah. we can use it for pesto, we can use it like normal European spinach. And this is oh. one of the local area's staples. So, which first? Joe had told me we'd be able to forage for all the vegetables for our meal within 50 feet of her fire. This salt bush? Yeah. You can add it to fish. Salt, it's quite bitter. <laughs> Not poisonous? No. Once you've got your eye in, turns out the beach is a super market garden. So this is... This is the sea mustard. I reckon I could use this in my fish cooking. We would have used it to flavour our seafood, our shellfish. Brings the fish to life. This I like. You like I mean, this? I like the other stuff, don't get me wrong, but this, this is... This you like so far. Back at the kitchen, Dinner's still roasting, 
at 200 degrees, about gas mark six. Not that Joe's told me what it is we're cooking. Be gentle, it's one long piece right there. So we'll just shake all of that off. It's a sort of fish-shaped package. Oh, you've got some roux in there. I've got some roux in here for you to try as well. Kangaroo in a paper pouch. So it's a bit charcoal-y, but we'll just slide the paper bark off. This is flathead. And so I've already stuffed it with some lemon myrtle and native limes. Uh -huh. Now so it's time to try. Warrigal green pesto with your fish. That's very good. And sometimes I think actually a bit of well-cooked fish is no bad thing. I love this. The next course is that roast kangaroo. I've actually used the Davison plum with the kangaroo here. Can I try a bit now? You sure can. For you, while you're carving. I didn't think it was going to be terribly good, <laughs> but it's, it's very nice. Well, they're the limes that I used inside the flathead. They pack a punch. They pack a punch, wow. <laughs> and these are our native limes. Got to try everything. I love using that as a wow. lemon, lemon curd tart. That's got tang. I think that Australians are starting to become aware of how great their local produce is. And this is only a tip of the iceberg that we have here today. There's one final treat left in the embers. It's yeah. crocodile. There is the croc. So this would be one portion. This is what they could do in restaurants for chefs that say it's too hard. Yeah. As a katush with the paper bark and the banana leaf. So we'll just chop that up. It's going to be hot. If you didn't tell me what it was, I'd say it was some sort of fish. I like it. There's a lot you could do with Aboriginal food. I think we've tended to just sort of, not we, Australians have tended to sort of look towards Europe, look towards Asia. I would be glad to see a lot more of this produce widely used. It is fresh, it's vibrant, it's seasonal, and it's local and it's 100% Australian-owned, Aboriginal, cultivated and looked after. Why cannot the rest of the world enjoy what we've enjoyed for thousands and thousands well, of years? Well, I think it's up to, to you Aussies to make more of it. I'm hoping in the next five, ten years that this is the forefront on a lot of main menus. Beating about the Australian bush offers tantalising possibilities and extraordinary taste sensations. After seeing two great chefs trying their hand with foraged ingredients, I know wild is the next big thing. And the wildest place of all is nestled in a silver sea a thousand miles to the south. Tasmania used to be seen as a bit of a joke, rustic and wild, meaning backward. But wild is suddenly hot, meaning Taz is newly cool. The future of Aussie cuisine. So who's laughing now? In a country where popping down to the shops can mean a hundred mile round trip. The flight south is only a short hop, but it's not so much about distance as time and traveling back in it. Tasmania is old fashioned, as in charming, innocent and unspoiled. I did once visit the capital, Hobart, But this Eden is new to me. It doesn't feel like Australia. But you never realise how truly wonderful something is until you experience it itself. As well as beauty, I can already see that there is bounty here too. They're everywhere, besides for fresh fruit. Apricots, raspberries, cherries. Pink eyes, I think that's some sort of potato, not a fish. And there's fruit farms everywhere. A lot of these are small scale operations, sort of second job farming. There's not a combine harvester in sight. I keep thinking, shall I stop or shan't I? Maybe around the next corner. Eventually it got to me. Time for the driver reviver, Tazzy style. I couldn't carry on without stopping. Blueberries. I just can't resist blueberries. 
and apricots. You don't get enough apricots back home. Delicious. I mean, this is heaven for me. I love my fruit. And just being able to stop and get it on the road, roadside. Perfection. I'm like feeding the meter. I'm not sure if you're actually supposed to eat out of one of these um, stalls, but I do like that. If you choose to steal my produce, I hope you choke. Dollars lighter and pounds heavier, back on the road, now able to pass signs for fruits that can stay forbidden. But amongst them, a sign for something that's just too intriguing to pass by. Now, as I've said, I reckon bushmeat is the future, but the wallaby must be a mammal too far. Most Aussies think of it as vermin. This bloke thinks of it as gourmet food. Stay on the right. OK. And the farm's just near, th near there. That's brilliant. OK, see you later, Ross. That was Ross Amira. He's a pig farmer by day, but a wallaby hunter by night. Tasmania is about as remote as you can get, but to see Ross means taking a ferry to somewhere even more out of the way, the tiny island of Bruni, only accessible by ferry, a kind of marsupial Jurassic Park. He farms somewhere in the woods and tells me that alongside his pig business, he set up a wallaby operation that's thriving. Apparently, there are 500,000 Tasmanians and 10 million wallabies. That's bad for the animals and for the environment, which they destroy. Ross O'Meara has a solution. Hi, Ross. Hi, Rick. Nice to meet you. You're a pig farmer, but it's, this is hardly what I sort of imagine when you say pig farmer. You imagine, you know, Big, big stalls big and concrete. Big stalls, concrete and, yeah, and stuff. Yeah, like, I would love to say you sort of slip under the net in yeah, a way. Completely. Look yeah. Look at that. He's just having a crawl. <laughs> this is what everybody dreams, free range pork, isn't it? He's beautiful with the young ones. And as you can tell, they like hanging out with the big fella. Oh, don't they just? One thing I'll say in Tasmania, yeah. wallaby is the main source of the diet. There's a lot of Tasmanians that have always eaten it. I've got a few Tasmanian friends that will make a roostroni or they'll make wobble and a's or that. Yeah. It's, it's a beautiful meat. Oh, I'm looking forward to trying it. I've, yeah. ne I've never tried it. The best part about it, it's organic, grass-fed, free-range meat. So it's a fantastic product. To get hold of wallaby meat, we need to hunt by night. The population's exploded because there are so many delicious crops on Bruni and no natural predators, except hunters like Ross. Well, we're just off to a neighbouring property. They, they've asked Ross to come in and cull the wallabies. I get the impression that when they took the property over, they thought that wallabies are really cute. But now they've realised how the wallabies devastate the habitat. They've asked them to come in all the time. Tasmania is the only place in Australia where you can legally kill wallabies for food. Much of it goes to feed pets. Ross is out to harvest meat destined for discerning diners. So what we'll do is, if you can see down there on the fence line, yeah. they'll sit there in the bushes there and they'll slowly work their way out. And we'll just sit down until it gets a little bit dark. They'll come out, they'll start feeding. And then once you put the spotlight on, that kind of stuns them and they just stop. That's, that's, that's when it. you pick them off? Yeah. Sure enough, it's not long before the wallabies make an appearance. Here's one there, on the side of the fence. If it's for human consumption, Ross must get a clean headshot. Oh my gosh! Wow! That's always good to get it straight off the bed. And, and you got it in the head, did you? Yeah, yeah, it's dropped straight away. It just went just down like that. Yeah. I'm very impressed with that. It must be... It's a very small target, and it's a clean shot right in the head. 
Thanks to Ross's skill, the kill was instantaneous. Gosh. Next morning, the wallaby is roasting in an anchovy stock. Being fresh, it needs slow cooking to tenderize it. This second one's been hanging for a few days and could be simply fried. So I'll take the shanks off now. You can cook them like you would any other shank, like a lamb shank. So they braise up really well. So there's the two shanks there. Ross has carved out two prime wallaby cuts, top side and one from close to the spine, known as the back strap. I just got a little bit of salt and pepper. I just drop a little bit of olive oil on it. Here we go, and I'll get these ones in the pan. Okay. Get the other one on the other side. And I'll get the back strap too. I need a bit more salt and pepper on this side. I like the fact you're just cooking it just with salt and pepper because I just have a feeling that there'd be a lot of people out there who'd be marinating it for three weeks and all kinds of rubbish. And basically, all I want is to taste what it's like. I'll probably put a little bit of a teaspoon of bacon fat in there just to get a little bit of crackling going and a little bit of moisture. Love bacon fat. Do you, yeah. you cook with a lot of bacon fat? I do because I tend to have a lot of bacon <laughs> loose around the house. So <laughs> drop that fat in there now. I'll taste a bit. Oh, that is lovely. It's good, clean fat, isn't it? And it's slightly yeah. bit of smokiness, lovely, savoury taste to it. Take them off the side to rest. A delicious smell has started to permeate the air. Kiki! The family pooch is as fit as any butcher's dog I've ever met. Time for me to try the slow roast meat from last night. My first taste of wallaby. Oh, see the weight? Oh, that. yeah, it's peeling off. Can you try a bit? Yeah, 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 go for that. It's like a little drumette. That's gorgeous. That is really lovely. I'd sort of like a lamb shank, only much lighter in flavour. Fabulous. Delicious and fragrant. Now to see if the older hung meat is gamier. Ooh, have a little bit of a taste. I must say, it looks very appetising. You go for that bit Thanks. there. I'll give you this one first, the top side, being that I reckon it's got a bit better flavour. Fabulous. Mm. A little bit chewy, mm. but do you know, that is really lovely. So there's the back strap there. It's fab. I'd say it's a bit like... Babette, you know, like yep. a slightly less than ten, totally tender beef cut, but it's got a better flavour to me. Yeah. And I, I'm just amazed that, that it's held in such sort of low esteem. I mean, this is like gourmet food to me. Yeah, it's great, mate. It's just there, you know. So basically, yeah. we're having something nice to eat. Yeah. And you're doing good for the environment. Correct. And Everyone's also, a winner. Yeah. Even the wallabies. True. Not this wallaby. No. Wallaby meat is nothing short of a revelation. I really do think we're onto something here. I think something like that will be the next big thing. And of course, wallaby meat is wild meat. So Ross and others like him will always be small scale producers. In a place seemingly unsullied by the modern world, this is farming far removed from the almost industrialized food production I'm used to on the mainland. And on the evidence so far, the result is superb quality. It does have this wonderful image of purity, clean air, clean water. And I think that's what it means to the rest of Australia. So the products from Tasmania are seen to be top quality. The search for emerging Tasmanian products leads just a little north to the island's capital, Hobart. This is the only bit of Tasmania I'd visited before. On the mainland, things have moved on, but Hobart is just as I remembered it. Gosh, I've been coming to Australia for a long time. When I first arrived in, in Sydney, it looked a bit like this. I can remember the first shopping malls being built. But now, Sydney, just like that. And this is the capital of Tasmania. That's rush hour over there. I mean, it's hard to believe. 
but it just reminds me so much of when I first came to Australia and it's wonderful but it's patronizing to think of this place as a twee backwater I'm here to find out what the future holds what's drawn me to Hobart is a brochure for a product I wouldn't have associated with Tasmania and even more surprising seems they do it better than anyone else did you know that the world's best single malt whiskey comes from here in Tasmania? Uh, I sort of did, mate, but I didn't know where about's from. <laughs> you didn't? No. So you've never tasted it? No, I haven't, mate. I'm not a whiskey drinker. <laughs> Fair enough. Maybe when you drop me off, I could, um, I could get them to give you a taste. Uh, yeah, once I knock off from work, mate, yeah. Seems Tasmania's quiet food revolution really is quiet. Even the locals haven't heard about it. In my day, Aussies mostly drank beer, and so did I, like a beery fish. Later, their wines emerged. But now this distillery has conquered the whiskey world. In 2014, theirs was voted the best single malt anywhere. It's even more amazing when you consider that Patrick McGuire and his team only started making whiskey 15 years ago. What's so special about your Tasmanian whiskey, do you think? Then? We are lucky enough to be small, unknown, with no demands on what we're doing. We didn't have demands. Um, so we've got the luxury of time. So we do things in a very old fashioned way. Uh, we take months to dilute and allow our whiskies to settle. So it, it's an old fashioned, raw style of whiskey. I mean, it's a natural for Tasmania. We've got a, a nice, cool climate. Uh, we've got a lot of high-quality barley grown here. Our water is fantastic. So all the ingredients are there. We're a long way away from anywhere else in the world. So if we're going to compete, we have to produce a very high-quality product. Doesn't matter what it is. Uh, it'll be small quantities, but high value. Now, I'm not a big whiskey drinker, but this is work. I have to steal myself. Well, Rick, have a, have a little glass of... Uh, oh, it smells a bit strong. Of our matured whiskey. This, this one's around um, 14 years old now and will be, be careful, up around 70% alcohol. Wow. I can smell it from here. Is this the one that won the prize, then? That barrel was, was bottled out in its entirety. Is there any um, left? We've got three bottles. Are you going to sell them or keep them? And, uh, and what, what would they be offering? If you, you know? Look, we've been offered some very serious money for those, for those like bottles. Like, how serious? Well, up to $20,000 a bottle. So 20000 bottle. Yeah. Blinking hell. Yeah, I know. That's what we said. <laughs> Let me just tell you what I think of this. Yeah, all right. Being poetic, this tastes like some trout's dream somewhere in Tasmania. I, I always find good whiskey and water have a sort of affinity. And yeah. I think of sort of slightly brackish mountain water, trouts. Sounds good, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. Perhaps we should get the rods out. It's about quality, not quantity. I think the secret of Tasmanian success is keeping it small and artisanal. And trading on the purity of products from the sort of environment that's a copywriter's dream. Looking out of my window, whiskey seems more and more at home here. But for the gum trees, Tasmania could be Scotland. I mean, when you look out of the window and you see all this water and the hills and mountains behind, here in the south, the valley floors are full of sea locks, and they're home to an industry that's familiar in Scotland, but a bit of an innovation here. These big inland areas of seawater are covered with fish farms. I've been passing them all day. 30 years ago, nothing. It's a well-known story in the Aussie food business. In just three decades, the Tasmanian salmon industry has gone from literally nothing to world-beating. Pristine waters and careful attention to welfare have produced fish that fetch the highest prices in Japan. 
And now one of Japan's best sushi chefs has come over here and caused his own mini culinary revolution. Which is how I come to have a Tasmanian salmon on the back seat and a bit of a deadline. 30 years ago when I started doing TV, um, you wanted to do something. You, you said, I'm going to take this from A to B and you did it. But these days you've got to sort of jazz it up a bit. They call it jeopardy, I call it melodrama. And it goes a bit like this. I've got a monster salmon in the back, but I've got to get it to a sushi chef in time for lunch. But there's a problem. I've got directions and I've got a sat nav, and I don't really know how to read the map or work the sat nav. And worse still, it's getting warm. The salmon's beginning to heat up. Well, there's air conditioning, but it's not working very well. It's 90 degrees outside, and I can only go at 55 miles an hour. Will I make it in time for lunch? Will I? Bit more of that, and I could be on top gear. The master chef I'm seeking is Masaki Koyama, formerly of Osaka, but now living in the bijou town of Jeevston. I've heard of tiny towns, but this one is supposed to be just off the main drag. Where is the main drag? Is this the main drag? There's a swearing chemist. It's supposed to have very colourful language. I love his trousers. There we are. There we are. Sushi. Fab. In just six years, Masaki has transformed local tastes, just as all those immigrant chefs did in Sydney. The neighbours can't get enough of his sushi. He's already setting about my salmon with a plum. This is good for sashimi. Oh, I love salmon sashimi. I just love watching the way really well-trained sushi chefs work. There's such a sort of delicacy about the way they cut everything. It's like a sort of form of massage to me. It's just so peaceful. I'm just cutting off the fatty part. A uh, little bit of fishy flavour. When he first arrived, Masaki opened seven days a week to put himself on the map. Today, his sushi is so popular, he opens just twice a week, and then only for lunch. His few tables and tiny takeaway counter pull in locals and enthusiasts from all over the island. Wow, look at that! You, you must think you've died and gone to heaven, yeah, really. Actually, I was Masaki's very first customer. <laughs> I was waiting blow. outside the door when I heard there was sushi place yeah. opening in town. The ex-premier came three times yes. before she could get in. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was booked out. People come and it's sold out within an hour. Jeeveston's a town in love with sushi, but local tastes weren't always so sophisticated. It was very interesting for me to start at first. I never met people, never eat uh, rice before. They never eat rice. <laughs> I was a sushi virgin. I just wanted to introduce my food, and then uh, just people started coming back again and again. The locals have embraced Masaki sushi, and Masaki has done the same with the outstanding local ingredients. I thought the best way is using local produce. So, for example, beetroots. Um, we don't have beetroot in Japan, but uh, I just love it and very tasty. And what about the salmon? How did you find that, the quality? Salmon quality is very good. Never seen this fresh before in Japan. I was very lucky. Uh, I, could do, I, I could do a lot of experimenting all the time. Using the finest Tasmanian produce seems to have freed Masaki up to take sushi to the next level. This one's a yellowfin tuna and snow pea. This is a cooked tuna. This one's a cold smoked ocean trout. We have prawn and avocado here. And this one is the Japanese egg omelette. And Masaki Zanari is a bean curd pouch with rice, honey brown mushrooms, beetroot, sesame seeds and carrot. As a chef, it's just a privilege to see someone like Masaki at work. I often go on about how I like watching people do things they do well, but this is in a class of its own. Masaki trained for three years, much of it spent in A&E, then honed his craft for another 22. So what is the perfect way to treat the perfect salmon? Nice size, not too big. Uh -huh. 
not too small, just harvest it right away. Yeah. Rest about one day or two days. Of course, um, you have to have good skill to fill it. Eat with friend, that's best, I think. When I look at that, I just think, I, I can't, you know, I virtually can't keep uh, the chopsticks off it. It looks so beautiful. For me, when a product of this quality meets a chef this skilled, the result is, is well, it's a kind of poetry. That's it. They're closed now for five days. They need to get on with the more serious things in life, surfing, fishing, maybe a bit of gardening. And for me, it's a great business model. It's called Less Is More because this is some of the best sushi I've ever had in my life in this tiny town. It's unbelievable. On the mainland, Australian industry shouts a lot about its success. But these islanders seem happy to whisper and wait for people to notice their genius. Which isn't always a good thing. One of the most famous Tasmanian foodstuffs is virtually unknown on the mainland. Getting to the point of production is a bit tricky. Getting there's half the fun. Got to roll up my trousers. What I'm after seeing is abalone, a large sea snail. They're found all around the island in bays and inlets. Many of them are known only to the fishermen who go after them. Uh, abalone and crayfish is the, 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 one of the main specialities of the, uh, of the local fishing boat. And we see those guys come in and out in various remote spots around the Tassie coast. Abalone are subsea fat cats. They lead a jet-set life gliding about on sunlit rocks, sucking in the rich nutrients that drift by on the currents. Who needs runways when you've got a seaplane? Abalone grow very slowly. Scott Palmer and his fellow fishermen don't moan about fishing quotas. They've asked the government to impose them. Nobody wants to upset this trade. 25% of all the wild abalone eaten on Earth comes from Tasmania. To make a fishing trip worthwhile, Scott and his divers stay out harvesting for days. But to get a sample catch, one dive is enough. This is what we're looking for, Rick. Yeah. yeah. Trust me? Yep. So, this is them. This is our Tasmanian black lip abalone, Rick. And um, how do they rate as um, Tasmanian um, abalone in the scheme of abalones? Or... World's best. World's best, of course. World's best, yeah. And um, where's your biggest market, then? It's in China. Really? We have um, about 70% go live into China now. Do Aussies eat this? Um, Melbourne, Sydney and Chinatown, you see abalone, but you don't see a lot of abalone in the rest of the rest of the restaurants, no. And why, why is that, do you think, then? I think it's just people haven't tasted it. If it's not cooked properly, it comes out like boot leather. It, it was, people I kill think... each other in other parts of the world for abalone. It's big business. They fetch around $100 a kilo or even more. That's 25 bucks each. So how much do you come home with then? Well, when these tanks are full, Rick, we've got uh, three live tanks on board. When these are all full of abalone, she's got six ton of abalone on board. Six ton? Six ton. Well, that's only three hundred thousand dollars. It's getting it? close to it, but well, how often do you go to sea then? Um, about eighty to ninety days a year. Ah, I see. Well, no, <laughs> no wonder you're smiling. <laughs> Diesel's very dear, Rick. Oh come on! <laughs> that's what fishermen always say. <laughs> Scott's sitting pretty as long as the Chinese market remains steady. But the trick will surely be to alert Australia to what they've got just off their own coast. First, the meat gets a good bashing to tenderise it. Okay. There you are. 
Scott's a man after my own heart, keeping seafood simple. I'm liking the look of this, I must say. I mean, they've got a, quite a lot of flavour, um, so I, I don't think you need to do a great deal with them. Well, we're just about ready to start frying these. And what, what are you frying them in? In ghee. In ghee, in Indian ghee? Yes. Oh, great. I like seafood fried in ghee. I picked it up in India. I thought I could smell ghee. I, that's very unusual. I don't cook it really hot. Like, not a, a... No, I never do either, because yes. it burns stuff. They're not far from done. That's quick. It smells great. Look at that. Now, would you like a little bit of salt on that or not? Oh, yeah, I love a bit of salt. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a very good Chardonnay from Tasmania. Wow, now you're talking. This is um, <laughs> abalone Chardonnay. So we've got the fine china. Oh, the fine china. Let's go for One it. One of our premium Tasmanian wines. Good health. Good health. Oh, that's nice. God, Beautiful, that's really good. Really yeah. full of fruit, bit of oak, lovely. And now for this. Oh, tender. You're a seafood cook. I can't tell you how good that is, really, seriously. I mean, if, if the average Aussie could taste that, right, they would be converted instantly because it's like a prawn fritter. It's almost like as a, a sweet and as tasty as a prawn. And it's as tender. I mean, you tenderised it so well. That is absolutely delicious. I love abalone. I'm in love with abalone. Abalone has got to be the best seafood Australia isn't eating. And I reckon the Tasmanians should be shouting about them from the rooftops. I started this journey with an inkling that what I call the Australian national palate is changing. That they're starting to look to what they grow and harvest in their own backyard. And I think the Aussies are on the right track. Wow. The foods I've tasted here have been as good as anything, anywhere. Oh. And Australia's tended to look towards the rest of the world for, for ideas, for, for materials, for food. They tended to import all the best stuff. And only now they begin to realise they don't need to do that. That if they, if they work hard enough at what they're producing here, the world will look at them. I came here trying to find my place in the world, and so were they. We were both very young. Modern Federal Oz was only about 200 years old, and I'd been coming here for a considerable chunk of its existence. And in that time, it's made me the happier man I am. There's this optimism about this country, and it's about being in a new world and having boundless opportunities. But it is, it always lifts me up whenever I come here. I think Aussie cuisine is about to take a great leap forward. Well, backwards, if you like, to where it all began with local. And with around 2,900,000 square miles of local to leap into, watch this rather large space. Next time, in Malaysia, cook and food writer Rachel Koo journeys to the heart of her own family history. Oh my goodness, that's, that's my dad! Yes. She goes off the beaten track to find out whether food can unite a multicultural society. This is a, at another level. Thank you. More foodie adventures with a cook abroad on BBC iPlayer. Catch up with the series so far. Well, here on BBC Two next, Lisa Tarbuck and Richard Osman get ready to play darts for comic relief.